party this morning. We've had a conference meeting this morning to basically decide the uh, fate of the appropriation bills for the rest of the year. So it sort of was a important conference meeting. The speaker sort of laying out our plan. So uh, I tried to go by there for a minute before we uh, started here. So it's uh, uh, good to have you here, though, and thank you for your uh, uh, presence here this morning. And uh, of course, welcome to the appropriation subcommittee for the. Uh, this is our third hearing for FY uh, 17. And I'm sure my colleagues will agree that we've been off to a very quick and swift start. Uh, we have this, as I say, makes our third hearing not only that we've had this year, but this week. So we have been uh, very busy and uh, trying to get these appropriation bills finished uh, in a, a very uh, quick and diligent manner so that we can try to move these appropriation bills to conference uh, in regular order. Um, I've already shared some of the themes that I, uh, we've set for the subcommittee. Uh, as we have met earlier in the, in the week. But as a reminder, let me just say that uh, uh, as uh, four of those are our themes are, number one, increasing oversight efficiency and need for effective outcomes. Uh, number two, keeping rural America vibrant. Three, supporting American farmers and ranchers and producers. And number four, protecting, protecting the health of people, plants, and animals. And today we'll focus on theme number one, increasing oversight efficiency and the need for a effective over, uh, outcomes. This builds off the oversight activities over the past several years, and it corresponds with uh, the Inspector General's efforts uh, on this issue. Ms. Fong, we look forward to learning more about your work and uh, to encourage USDA to improve its governance process and internal controls to be more disciplined and transparent in its decision making. This subcommittee respects your work and we appreciate your recommendations on ways to continually improve the management of a large, complex, and important part of the federal government. In fact, the subcommittee uh, recognized your work, your important work, and included directives related to improper payments and unachieved savings in the FY16 report to the Secretary, among others. The committee also recognized your leadership among the IG community. Not only did you lead the Council for Inspector Generals on Integrity and Efficiency, which represents the entire IG community, but your work won every single one of the awards that the Council gives out in 2015. So you should be very proud of your work and uh, those that uh, work with you on that, So, and I know you are. Uh, I'd also like to th uh, thank you for agreeing the request that uh, the ranking member and I had Mr. Farr to uh, review the New York Times allegations about the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. Uh, your assistance in auditing the claims included in the article and reviewing the current conditions, the practices and the policies um, will be very helpful to us and we look forward to having an update on your, <coughs> your work on this issue. Uh, before I recognize the uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Farr, for his opening statement, I'd like to thank him for his cooperation and uh, his uh, can, a collegial working relationship that we have had on the subcommittee. Uh, while we sometimes have different priorities and sometimes maybe view things from a different angle at, from time to time, we both want USDA to be effective and efficient and in implementing the laws and the programs uh, that, that Congress puts forth. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Farr for any comments and opening statements that he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and appreciate um, the congeniality in which we conduct this meeting and uh, this, this committee and look forward to working with you. And I think it could be a very exciting year and, and, and or it could be a real tough year, depending on, you know, it's an election year, so it's, there's a lot of uncertainties as to how people want to message Washington. And, uh, and it all comes down to what the Appropriations Committee is doing. And certainly our job is to have some oversight of this agency and I'd like to just thank all the people at the table, Ms. Fong and Mr. Hart and, Mr. and Ms. Coffey for uh, being here today. And um, you know, you, you are, USDA is the partner for rural America, uh, OIG through your audits, investigations and recommendations help us make sure that USDA is a good partner. And I want to thank each of you for the hard work uh, in this respect. Yesterday, uh, Secretary Vilsack was here, and he uh, commented on how frequently he hears, I didn't know USA, USDA did that, that it's a department with just incredibly broad um, jurisdiction. Um, you know, when you think about all over the world in our ag advisors and embassies, our, uh, our, our role here in this committee on the F uh, Future Tr uh, Commodities Trading Commission, 
on all the rural programs that go on um, and they just think it has to do with agriculture per se and not with so much with people and poverty and you are the watchdog for all these programs so I, suspe I suspect uh, you hear much of the same thing that they don't know that you do all the, these jobs oversight is critical responsibility of government and I always feel that sometimes we don't spend enough time in Congress with our oversight role and uh, it really is, it's, it's nice to have you as in helping us do that. Um, I understand the request for FY17 for OIG is a modest $5.2 million increase. <coughs> we know investments in OIG provide significant returns, and I'm confident we will hear today that OIG will continue to provide great value to USDA and to the people uh, the agency serves. Like the chairman, I'm interested in hearing a um, follow-up on a couple of previous issues that we talked about uh, in the past year. Uh, problems with the information technology improvements in the Farm Service Agency and, as the chairman talked about, the animal welfare problems at the Agriculture Research uh, Services uh, USMARC uh, facility. Uh, I'd also be interested in your evaluations of outreach uh, to veterans and uh, outreach to new farmers. I look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Uh, Ms. Fong, uh, we are, the floor is open for your uh, opening statement, and uh, we look forward to, to hearing that. So you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Farr and members of the committee for your very, very warm welcome. And we uh, always appreciate the opportunity to come up here and talk with you about the work we're doing, the challenges we're seeing, and what we plan for the next fiscal year. Um, and as well as addressing our FY17 budget request, as, as you all have mentioned. As you know, OIG provides audit and investigative services to help USDA deliver its programs more effectively. That has been and continues to be a challenge for all of us. Overseeing the effective delivery of USDA programs is a significant challenge, and, and I appreciate the fact that this subcommittee recognizes that. We believe that this challenge requires a sustained focus on excellent management at all levels of the department. Through our work over the past year, we are seeing that the highest policy levels of the department have shown leadership and commitment in this area. But at the individual agency level, implementation and follow through has been uneven. And particular issues, areas that come to mind um, in terms of how the department is addressing its challenges. I think of our work in cybersecurity, the work on improper payments, financial management, IT investments, and procurement. In order for the department to make meaningful progress in these areas, we need to have concerted effort across all of USDA. And so we definitely appreciate this committee's keen interest in those management challenges. I know you have my written statement. Um, it highlights many of our key accomplishments, so I won't go into that in any great detail. Just want to highlight for you a couple of things. In the food safety area, we had a very significant case on egg recalls came to fruition this year involving salmonella and um, bribery of, of an AMS employee as well. That turned out very well. Um, in the area of food safety, we are also looking at um, AMS's procurements of, of fruits and vegetables, USDA's response to antibiotic resistance in livestock, and ARS's handling of sensitive technology. Uh, in response to this committee's interest, as, as you've mentioned, we are doing quite a bit of work at US Mark, and we will be very happy to elaborate on that in, in the question and answer portion of this. We also spend quite a bit of our time on the benefit programs at USDA. I think you all know that the SNAP program in particular represents a huge portion of the portfolio. And so we um, devote a significant amount of our investigative resources to that. And our statement goes through the results that we have gotten for our SNAP investigations. This year, we also did a significant audit on SNAP error rates. I think. Um, that's drawn quite a bit of attention, and we will be very happy to discuss that in more detail as well, as well as the work we've done on error rates in the school lunch and breakfast programs. In the farm program area, 
um, we do work on farm programs, crop insurance, and conservation programs. We've done several, we've reported several significant fraud investigative reports there. And we have um, an audit on the NRCS conservation easement program, which could be of interest to all of you. We are continuing our oversight this year, focusing on the highly erodible lands programs and the prairie pothole region wetland conservation programs. And as we've been talking, you know, the third area where we focus our time is on overall department management. We've issued numerous reports on USDA's IT systems and security, improper payments, the civil rights programs and outreach, and financial management. And while we are seeing some progress at the department policy level, again, we want to emphasize that concerted attention needs to be paid to these issues throughout the department within all of the individual agencies and offices. Um, I think you all know we have an upcoming audit on the claims resolution for Hispanic and women farmers. And we also have um, the USDA financial statement audits, which we expect to issue very shortly. Um, in conclusion, let me just thank the subcommittee for the support you've given us in resources and interest and time over the years and ask you to support the request for our increases for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in uh, your testimony, you mentioned that uh, this is the second year that USDA is delayed in submitting its uh, financial statesman statements. Uh, in particular, you mentioned that, uh, that problems are ongoing between the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, USAID, and the uh, Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, this is not the first time that this committee has noted problems with cooperation between USDA and uh, uh, USAID. Uh, this is um, a special and at times confrontational relationship between the two agencies uh, that uh, usually involves international food aid. Uh, in fact, in this 2016 House report uh, directed that the two agencies to update a memorandum of understanding between the two agencies. In addition, we understand that there's been trouble in obtaining information in response to questions for the record uh, for your hearing last year. Uh, what uh, my question would be is uh, would ask you to would describe in as much detail as you're allowed to do so uh, the outstanding issue or issues between the Commodity Credit Corporation and uh, USAID regarding the uh, financial statements. Okay. Um, let me just at a very high level inform the committee of where we are on this issue. Um, as you all know, the financial statement audits are usually due to OMB on November 15th. This year, um, and, and the Commodity Credit Corporation is one of the six standalone audits within USDA, which all roll up into the overall consolidated audit of the financial statements. This year, um, because of, I, th I think, challenges um, between in, in the process of getting the financial statements for the CCC completed, the um, the department requested an extension, um, and and the auditor for CCC is KPMG. They have been working very closely with CCC to obtain the information they need to issue an opinion. We believe the deadline, as you know, the deadline for for providing these audits to OMB is today. The extension is is today. We anticipate issuing that audit for CCC this afternoon. After we're done with this hearing, we'll go back and, and finish our work. And then the next step will be to issue the department's consolidated financial statement audit based on the roll-up of all of the audits for all of the pieces of the department. The deadline for that opinion is also today. And at this stage, we are on track to issue that one this afternoon, the consolidated for the department. Um, we will issue the, the reports to the department and to OMB, and we will make sure that we provide them to you as is our normal process. And we will be available to brief um, if, if you all are interested in that once we issue the reports. Okay. Is this the, um, the regarding this relationship? Uh, between the uh, USAID and the Com Commodity Credit Corporation. Is this, uh, has this been an ongoing issue that you have observed? 
this one is fairly new this year. I mean, part of the it's not a bone of contention, say, between CCC and USAID. It, it, the matter was whether CCC could provide sufficient evidence to the auditors and they have to work through USAID and getting that evidence to, to form an opinion. That's where it was and, and being able to provide the necessary evidence of the transactions. That's in particular what happened this year. Yeah. Is, but has there been in the, in the past ongoing issues? I, I don't recall, but I, but I will look into that and, and provide a summary. There has been different issues with CCC over the years, but I just have to look into it. What about the department as a whole with uh, USAID? From a programmatic standpoint, I don't know that I've done any recent work to, to be able to speak to that. Okay. All right. Uh, around this time last year, uh, you know, a lot of us were uh, shocked to learn about the accusations in the York, New York Times about the alleged uh, mistreatment of animals at the uh, U.S. Meat uh, Animal Research Center. Uh, in the article, uh, Mr. Farr and I, uh, or after the article came out, Mr. Farr and I uh, reached out to you to investigate the allegations, and we appreciate you looking into it. Based on the interim report uh, that you submitted uh, to us, there are certainly some areas that uh, US, USDA needs to address to ensure uh, animal care policies are followed. However, it appears that some of the allegations were not quite as shocking and, uh, as uh, they were initially uh, sounded. Uh, can you provide us with uh, some more details on where this review stands and what work remains to be done uh, uh, for the report to reach its conclusion? Yes, sir. Um, with regard to the statements that we've already issued in the interim report, it, as you know, some of them were, were, were true based on what they were saying. Some of them you needed a little more context to understand what was being said. Since issuing that report, we have continued to look at the, the remaining statements, but also doing work to look at ARS's oversight of the, at the animal welfare practices at U.S. Mark. We also reached out to the reporter from the New York Times to see if we could do an interview with him. He declined. We reached out to the person that made the allegations in the New York Times. We interviewed him. He provided some additional information for us to look at, so we've taken those allegations under review and trying as, as we're pulling our work together. We're also considering allegations and complaints raised by other interest groups. You know, different animal welfare groups submitted stuff to us once they knew that we were looking at it. So we evalu we're evaluating that information as well. Right now, we're in the latter stages of field work, and we'll be starting to draft the report and, and hope to have that out later before the summer. Well, please keep us informed as you move forward at the process, and uh, we um, will we'll continue. We want to certainly make sure that we uh, stay abreast of that. Uh, Mr. Farr. Chairman. Um, I'm completing about 42 years in, in elective office, and before that, I was a I, first job and was working for the uh, legislative analyst in California, which is sort of the OMB office. Only it's a little more, it's more, it's more powerful than that in the in the legislature. One of the things that struck me was that we would discover where the law was written and just sort of ended up having unintended consequences. I mean, it didn't get what it wanted. I mean, then you could just slap the, it was, a lot of this was an education on testing and things like that, and you could just slap the, 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 the schools or for not uh, teaching right when indeed the question in the law or the, the, the goal in the law was, um, was awkwardly written, so you couldn't need it. And I was just thinking, you're talking about error rates and things like that. And that the fact that OMB is sort of coming on to you and saying, you know, we, I, I guess this OMB guidance uh, notes are, uh, that, that there's some concern that they're overreaching. Um, I wondered if you could speak about that. But what I really would, would love to know is when you, are you able to sort of uh, say the law ought to be rewritten? Because I think this is the, the what we, w w Congress is never going to be fill its oversight capability to know when, the, when it, when it actually, you know, we write very generic law, and then you write the rules, and then it's got to be administered, and 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 then when there's errors at the local level, it's kind of beating up on the errors rather than going back and looking at maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to, maybe there's a better way of doing this, and I'm, and it seems to me that you have you could have that role and do is it ever used that way to come back and say uh, there are programs that are being administered much smoother, um, much uh, uh, with, with less error rates or things like that? I don't know. So I, I, I guess what I, I, I'm concerned is that 
OMB is a one stop, but they work for the president, not for Congress. And um, they ought to be able to come in in Congress in, every year with a report saying these are the things that ought to be cleaned up or fixed up. There's a better methodology. We don't get that information. So I'm concerned. What are they, what are they asking here? I, the, uh, I guess what I have written here is that the OIG's recent semi-annual uh, report to Congress notes concerns over OMB's guidance on implementing the Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act. What are some of those concerns that you have? Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I believe FITARA, which is the law that, that you're mentioning, uh, was th the purpose of that was to bring some, some discipline and improve IT acquisition processes within the government. And overall, I think that's an admirable um, goal. And I think the Act itself has some very good provisions that will allow the, the CIOs at each department and agency to really get a handle on the investments and to make sure that investments within a department are consistent and, and abide by the standards. Where we, I think, had a concern um, had to do with the particular role of the IG and, and our independence and how we interact with the CIOs and the agencies. Um, we are working with OMB to clarify that, and I think we are, we're on a very good path with that. But since it is a fairly new law, um, I think the proof will be in the pudding. You know, as, as it starts to get implemented, as you note, we'll see how things actually play out, see whether it's having a good impact. And as we look at IT investments within the department, um, we may have some observations to offer in, in future years. And that actually is one of our budget requests for FY17 is we are looking for some additional funds to allow us to audit um, significant IT system investments within the department to make sure that they're on time, they don't go over budget, they actually accomplish what the program managers want them to accomplish. Uh, you know, I think a key example that, that you all are aware of is the whole MIDAS system and how that developed. You all asked us to do some audit work on that because of concerns. So do those recommendations come back to us is that in, in pretty uh, measurable ways in which we as legislators can do, fix it? Well, the way that we would surface concerns and recommendations would be through our audit reports, generally speaking. And um, a as we look at systems, for example, MIDAS, we made recommendations to the to the um, department, I think, and, and because we forwarded the reports to you all, you are very aware of what we were finding there. Similarly, when FITARA gets implemented, as we look at how the CIO and the departments implement it, and we start to audit some of the systems there, we will be able to assess whether it's effective. And we will then, if, if there are findings and recommendations to be made, we would surface them through our audit recommendation process. And, and testimony like this, oversight hearings. Thank you. M Mr. Valadeo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Inspector General, for your time today. Again, uh, my question, I've got two questions. Uh, in your most recent semi-annual report to Congress, many issues were brought up in relation to the effectiveness of the web-based public health information system. One of them which uh, is the observation that the web-based system could only be used by inspectors when they had an adequate internet connection. This seems like a conclusion that could have been reached without an audit, but regardless, uh, I've, I'm interested in hearing more about this system and what recommendations you have made uh, to ensure that it, is, that it could be used in rural areas that often do not have reliable access to internet or even high-speed internet. Um, yes, sir. Thank you for the question. As part of that review, we, we went out to a certain select number of plants. I don't remember the exact number right off the top of my head. But as our auditors were there, they observed that the, the inspectors were trying to get on the system and they couldn't. Sometimes they had to, you know, go outside the building in order to, to get a connection. So we raised that issue with FSIS. During the course of our work for that audit, FSIS made some changes that they said were fixing the problem and, and bring speed to, to the connections, if you will. We listened to those, so we did not, and, and thought about them, um, and decided that it wasn't appropriate to make recommendations at that time because they said they were, had made changes and we hadn't tested those yet. 
We also have current work that's in process where we're out in a, almost 90 plants doing follow-up work related to work we've done with risk-based inspection as well as pre-slaughter activities. We're testing those connections again, and if there are other issues that need to be raised, we will be raising those with FSIS. We're completing that field work right now. All right, thanks. And then uh, agriculture plays a large role in the economy in my district, obviously. Uh, unfortunately, given the nature of uh, the rural nature of my district, uh, as well as economic constraints um, caused by many factors, uh, one major one being that the ongoing drought in California, many small farmers are being forced out of business. Just the other day, I heard from a constituent faced with the stresses of supporting his young family who had concerns over the cost of starting his own farm and the dif difficulty of staying in business. Programs like the Beginning Farmers and Ranchers uh, program that provides education and training as well as other programs at the USDA play a vital role in ensuring a new generation of farmers uh, is ready to take on the challenge of feeding the nation and the world. Again, in your semi-annual report, you have indicated that the USDA cannot ensure that the $3.9 billion for beginning farmers' uh, assistance in fiscal years 12, uh, 2012 and 2013 has achieved effective and measurable outcomes. Aside from the meetings with stakeholders and the unveiling of the new website, what recommendations do you have to help USDA ensure that programs for beginning farmers and ranchers can succeed? Yeah, we recognize that that is a significant initiative, both on the part of this committee as well as at the department, critical initiative. And I think our audit report um, pointed out that the challenges that the department faced in implementing the programs stemmed from a very basic um, need to have a strategic approach to de delivering the programs and then making sure that implementation funneled through all of the individual agencies within the department. That was a challenge early on. This administration has, has recognized it, as you point out, um, and they have now started to pull together to ensure that there is closer cooperation within the department. Gil, you might want to add some comments. I mean, that's, and that's essentially the message that we got coming out, that there, there was a serious lack of coordination because you had four or five different agencies out there doing, basically doing their own thing. And, and what was recognized as we were doing that work was that the, the need for coordination as we were also raising the question with them. Um, so they have agreed to, to go about that on a coordinated approach and we'll just have to see with follow-up if they, if they follow through with it because this is an issue that was raised much earlier on by GAO in two prior reviews. All right, well, thank you. And uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome uh, back, Ms. Fong and, and your uh, able uh, assistance. Uh, congratulations to you. Uh, you continue to do a, an admirable job. Uh, you are uh, certainly one of the, the stellar offices uh, in our government, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, let me uh, deal with the, uh, you mentioned the fraud investigations with uh, SNAP and WIC. Uh, over the past few years, uh, uh, as you know, I've had a continuing interest in the management challenges which many of our states have faced uh, in the administration and management of WIC and SNAP. Uh, for example, in Georgia, we face several major challenges ma managing the WIC and the SNAP program, uh, which thankfully we've been able to successfully work through and have now resolved. But I notice in your uh, FY budget justification that your office has joined with the Food and Nutrition Service as well as state and local partners on a joint SNAP initiative, which involves a multifaceted approach to combat SNAP fraud uh, by pursuing criminal and administrative action against both retailers and clients who engage in SNAP trafficking. Um, can you just discuss briefly some recent developments on that front? Uh, and secondly, uh, I'm pleased that you're working with uh, state and local governments on fraud issues, but can you tell me if there have been any discussions on possible initiatives uh, which could possibly assist our state and local partners in improving their actual management and oversight uh, practices with regard to SNAP and WIC, uh, rather than focusing uh, just on, on fraud. Uh, given our state's experience, uh, uh, I would urge both uh, OIG and FN FNS uh, to explore the, the um, development of best practices are some preventive measures, uh, including program training, guidance, and other measures which could assist the state agencies uh, in advance. 
uh, in avoiding certain pitfalls uh, in their stewardship of SNAP and, and WIC funding. Uh, is that something that you can do? Uh, uh, and if so, uh, I would like to request that you really, really consider doing that. It seems like it would uh, be a win-win for everybody and save uh, us a lot of uh, administrative time and you a lot of investigative time. Uh, and of course, it would make the, the programs work better uh, for the people who uh, are the recipients of those services. Um, and then thank you for your question, Congressman. I'm going to ask Ann to offer some comments on our SNAP initiative with, with states, but I wanted to just make a few comments first on your suggestion about management practices in the SNAP and WIC program and how we can work in a more proactive way to improve the management of those programs. Uh, we, we take effective management of those programs very seriously. We agree with you that to the extent that we can improve their management, we can avoid improper payments and fraud or, or at least start to address fraud. A number of the audits that we recently issued, I think, point out the way to the states on, in areas where they can actually do a, a better job. And I'm thinking in particular about the QC, pro, the quality control process in SNAP, very significant report we issued this past year, which points out a number of areas where the states could do a better job of determining eligibility right up front. Similarly, in the school lunch and breakfast programs, we have some similar kinds of findings. And in the WIC program, as you mentioned, we did an audit a year or two ago, which talks about how the states can perhaps do a better job of ensuring that, that their recipients get the best, the, the most benefit for their dollars. So I think we have a record of some very good recommendations, and we're, we're working with FNS to, to make sure that those get implemented. But I also wanted to give Anne a few moments on the SNAP. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, just a few comments on the SNAP initiative. That was intended to partner with the, uh, the Office of Inspector General Special Agents to partner with state and local um, law enforcement agencies to use best practices to share and identify ways there we can better combat fraud um, in a partnership. Um, so we have three, three locations within the initiative that are currently ongoing. Um, we have one that was initiated in uh, the state of Washington. We have one that is currently ongoing in um, Los Angeles County. And we have one that we just recently initiated in October of this past year, um, actually in the District of Columbia. Um, these are areas that were identified by FNS um, as areas where perhaps there needed to be a greater focus on the client side, on the recipient side of the fraud. Um, within investigations, we typically focus on the retailers. Um, because that's the direct funding from USDA to, um, to the retailer, whereas the states are administering the recipient side. So this was really more of a multifaceted approach to try to address the fraud on both sides, um, both on the client side as well as on the retail side. Those investigations are currently ongoing, so I'm somewhat limited as to what I can offer um, from a results perspective, but we would be more than happy to provide that information to you when we're drawing them to a to conclusion. When you go at the client, if the administrators, uh, the management team, uh, were on the team in the beginning, uh, then the clients would not be able to commit the fraud. If, if they have uh, best practices uh, and they are employing best practices, it seems like it would prevent uh, the fraud from occurring. I think probably from the perspective of that really goes to the eligibility issue mm -hmm. um, relative to the clients. Um, and, you know, I do believe that most of the states, and, and Gil can correct me on this, focus much of the funding on the, the front end looking at the eligibility requirements as opposed to the fraud side. Um, and so, you know, with respect to being able to um, engage, I, I, it would be difficult for us to say um, that individuals who are legitimately to receive the benefits would not still traffic um, potentially. Um, it, it, you know, I don't think we have enough information to be able to see that on the investigation side of the house. So is there an education program to um, make recipients uh, aware of the, the penalties that would uh, result from trafficking? I mean, it seems like that, that, that an education program or warnings uh, uh, when people uh, are being processed uh, and, and when they receive the benefits, that there ought to be some, some uh, communications that, uh, uh, some admonitions. 
would that not be, be a helpful practice, uh, a best practice? I think that's a very good idea, and we will follow up with FNS to see what we can partner with them in terms of raising um, awareness and making sure that people are well informed. Yeah. Thank you. I think my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Fong, thank you for your testimony. Um, a couple of things interested me greatly in your testimony, and I was curious if you could elaborate on some of them. As you're aware, the OPM breach that occurred last year was devastating and affected employees across all branches and agencies of the federal government. Many of our own staff were swept up in this unprecedented security failure. What effect did this breach have on USDA employees, and specifically its critical information like program beneficiaries and other sensitive information? Yeah, you raise a very good question. When, when the breach occurred, we immediately asked ourselves, what is going to be the impact on USDA? And, and we were thinking about it in a number of ways. We were thinking about it both in terms of individual employees as well as program participants, um, systems within USDA, what, what are the vulnerabilities and, and what do we need to do? And, you know, I, I think you're right, many of the USDA employees were affected personally. OPM is is got the lead on in terms of dealing with that issue. Where we focused our attention was on sitting down with the department, the CIO, the, the chief information officer, and with and with the um, policymakers to say, look, these are the issues we have seen at USDA over the past few years in the area of information te information technology security. We have seen vulnerabilities. We have consistently reported these vulnerabilities. Here in a package is what we are seeing overall, and these are the issues we think you really need to be focusing on because I think we all recognize that these threats are not going to go away. Um, we, we believe that we have a good dialogue with the CIO's office and, and with the policy level at, at the department, um, and we believe progress is being made. Of course, there's always room for more progress. And to build on that, I mean, we do have a very strong relationship with the CIO's office, both the current one as well as former ones. But as Phyllis said, we, we talked to the new CIO as he came in to identify the different things, and we meet with him periodically just to hear how things are going and, and, and make sure that we stay on top of stuff. Going forward, do you all have a plan for p perhaps preventing something like this from taking place again, or is there just a lot of identified weaknesses just waiting to be closed. Um, do you feel like you've uh, closed that technological gap or are we still at risk? And that's for Mr. Yeah. Harry Norris as well. No, Hall. And, and let me offer a few comments and Gil, you might want to jump in. Um, the challenge that we have at USDA is that the department's IT security profile is not good. Um, and we've reported that for many years. In order to really turn the corner on that and to, and to put the department in a good position, it's going to take a lot of effort, not only at the CIO department level, but at the individual agency level, because individu individual agencies within USDA are responsible for their, their internal security measures. And what we are seeing is that some agencies are better at this than others, there needs to be a really focused look across the department. Every agency needs to get into basic compliance with the IT security requirements that the government has. Um, you know, until that's done, and that will take some time. It will take some time and effort. And, and so we, we just need to keep the focus on. And, and Gil? Yeah, and what I would say is over the past couple of years, we've made progress at the department level where they have now started getting the policies in place that they need. It now turns to the agencies, as Phyllis said, to take those policies and implement those at the agencies. There's over 30 agencies at the department that all operate their own IT systems, and so it, it does take a while. But our annual IT security reviews with FISMA touch on, touch on this and bring it forward every year. There are a number of open recommendations that haven't been closed, uh, and we, work, we continue to work with OCIO to, to address those as well. Is, is there any... Uh, form of, of perhaps a whip or carrot type to make the functional managers take this serious? I mean, I know 
cybersecurity is a huge issue now, and it's been a huge issue, and we've talked about it. We, we, we started whispering about it, and now we're talking about it, now we're screaming about it. Um, it's, it's ongoing. We know there's bad actors out there that, for whatever reason, they're probing and trying to hack into our information. Um, it varies, I guess, depending on uh, country. Um, but is, is there a whip or carrot? I mean, can, I mean, you know, one thing that I've seen a lot in the government, it just seems like there's no, there's no means to punish um, poor behavior or irresponsibility. I mean, you know, people get write, written up. You get written up enough, you get transferred to another agency, but you're really not punished. And, and I'm just curious, is there a whip or carrot? Is, has it been adopted into the, the, the methodology of the department? The, the way the CIO is structured, and as I understand the underlying legislation, there isn't that whip and carrot that the CIO at the department has over the CIOs at the agency. So there is a lot of education and encouragement. As the OPM breach occurred and as we were talking to the department and we were briefing the secretary on the, on the issue, one of the things that, that he is using now, and we have seen his scorecard for this that he gets on a weekly basis in terms of how agencies are doing on IT security. Um, and so we continue to monitor that to see and he uses basically a, a red, yellow, green type score to see if people are getting better, and we can. And that's their way of monitoring it. You mentioned 30 different CIOs. Um, have y'all thought of data consolidation at any point? Is that perhaps a, a recommendation? I know Department of Homeland Security's done an extremely good job, and their information is extremely sensitive. Uh, and I haven't heard any of, of their data being breached. I'm just curious if if, if that's something that y'all have thought about. I know we've had some discussions that I'd have to go back and think about the depth of those discussions that we've had because I know the department has done some things I'm just not well versed on those immediately. Well as large as our government is there's always a best practice out there and so hopefully y'all can find the best practice and not recreate the will so with that thank you and it's always good to uh, have a fellow Mississippian uh, <laughs> and especially a fellow CPA um, testifying in front of us. Thank you Mrs. Fong. Ms. Pingree. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for being here today and for the work you've been uh, doing and explaining to us today. Um, last March, the USDA received a legal petition from the public employees from, for environmental responsibility requesting that the USDA adopt policies that would protect government scientists who question the health and safety of agricultural chemicals. Then Reuters reported that USDA scientists were having their work censored or suppressed, especially when it related to neonicotinoids or glyphosate, and especially when it conflicted with agricultural industry interests. In May of 2015, your office received a letter from advocacy groups urging you to start a thorough investigation into these reports of censorship. The letter mentioned some scientific evidence about linking glyphosate with the destruction of milkweed, which is obviously the primary food of monarch butterflies. I don't have to tell you all this, but there's certainly a lot of concern about the decline in monarch butterflies. And while it would be uh, unthinkable that there would be any kind of censorship at the department if it was also having an effect that it was detrimental to protections for pollinators, I think that would be even more of concern. So did the OIG respond to the request letter? Will there be an investigation reported about the reported censorship of USDA scientists, will you make the information publicly available? Let me, let me take, um, offer some comments on that, and then Gil might want to offer some. You're right. We have been aware and we have been made aware of the concerns of research scientists. We received the letter. We also have, our hotline has received complaints as well. This is an issue that um, is very troubling, and we, we certainly take it very seriously. We have, as, as you know, a lot of work going on right now at U.S. Mark, which raises similar kinds of concerns. And so given all of that, we've, we've looked and we have an audit in our plan to assess whether or, or to what extent, whether and to, or to what extent there may be concerns and as, whether there are any bases to these concerns on the part of research scientists. We, I think we're formulating an approach right now but we plan to do that work this year. And certainly when we do our work, it will become publicly available when we're done. Yeah. So I guess you haven't, you haven't started the process, but you're taking it seriously. Yes, we, ha saying? we have a commitment. It's in our audit plan to okay. do a... And to ahead. go a little bit further than that, I do have a team that's assembled 
that's currently looking at the information that's been received and trying to figure out an approach as to how we're going to go about looking at it. So yeah, it is something that if we haven't opened it already, it is, it is in, to be opened in the very near future. And so the time frame is soon? For opening it, yes. Our audits typically take six, six months to 12 months to complete, mm -hmm. depending on the methodology. And in this case, um, to assess the, the viability of, of those concerns um, might require us to use slightly different methodology than we use in our normal audits, which is why we, we just want to spend some time thinking about how to go best assess those issues. So without getting too detailed, are you, are you looking at the censorship aspect, the whistleblowing blower aspect, or are you kind of taking a comprehensive look at what's going on here? And, and were you saying when you're, in your answer to me that you had some of the similar concerns at the mark? Yeah, I mean, none of those issues are off the table. I mean, in, in terms of as, as we approach it, we know that we're looking at all the different issues that are raised in the complaints, the letters that are raised to us, to see if those are issues that we can actually go out and figure out a way of objectively evaluating. Uh, the, usually where we don't take on issues are, 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 is where we can't see where we can do an objective review of them to balance them against something um, and checking them out. But that's all in part of setting up the approach. and. There are a number of scientists that have made complaints. We want to consider is there a way possibly of surveying the, the community to find out what people's thoughts are. Um, I guess one last question. Just historically, has this been a problem before, or are you saying this has just started to happen over a period of recent time? This is the first that I'm aware of it. Uh, you know, we may have in the past received individual or, or isolated complaints but this is the first that we've seen a, a significant volume, and which is why we are taking it seriously. And we would be very happy to brief you or your staff once we determine our methodology on our scope, methodology, and, and time frames. Great. That would be um, very helpful, and I would appreciate that very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Swong, thank you for joining our committee today. Uh, I want to ask you a couple questions about the Farm Bill implementation. Uh, topics that have been raised in this committee before. Uh, like just to get an update on some of the SNAP savings that were uh, agreed to as part of the Farm Bill compromise. We spent the morning talking um, somewhat about the error rates and that's been very instructive. I'm also interested in the over $8 billion in savings that were expected to come from closing the loophole, the uh, heat and eat loophole that um, 17 states were exploiting uh, that was the central part of the Farm Bill in, uh, two years ago in which there were about $23 billion in savings uh, total, the vast majority of which came from cutting uh, programs to farmers and agriculture producers and uh, families. And the other portion uh, was savings that were achieved by eliminating the heat and eat uh, loophole, it, which is where states were uh, essentially using federal dollars to trigger uh, uh, additional food stamp benefits that folks were not eligible for. And so Congress fixed that in a broad bipartisan deal. And it was supposed to save $8.5 billion in savings. Uh, it became clear shortly thereafter that states would just meet the new threshold, which was $20 as opposed to a dollar or 10 cents, whatever it was before, uh, and so that the savings may not have been achieved. And so I guess, yeah, can you update us on um, where the savings would be on that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just conferring with Gil, I don't believe that we have looked specifically at that issue to determine whether or not the savings have been realized. We can, we can take that up as part of our planning. Well, I just think you're the Inspector General of the USDA and the implementation of the Farm Bill is a, a key part of what the USDA is doing and a big key part of that is savings that were to be achieved in what was a lengthy debate on the House floor. Uh, and uh, all sides coming forward to say we've got to have deficit reduction. You know, we're still running a half trillion dollar deficit in this country. And it wasn't much, but it was $23 billion in savings over 10 years. And I guess I'd like a report from you to this committee on uh, how much we've actually saved and whether those savings have been realized. And if not, uh, what has occurred? And beyond just the error rates and SNAP, what about the intentional efforts by certain states to exploit a loophole to draw down greater federal dollars that Congress intended to fix. Okay. Um, okay. We'll be happy to look into that. All right. Now, along with that, um, there's been a, a 
discussion about SNAP error rates, and uh, you mentioned the WIC report, and we've discussed that in this committee before, and the error rates there. And um, uh, I know there's also uh, a significant uh, set of error rates in the school lunch program. Uh, I think by USDA said in its study, one in five children were certified in the wrong category. It's 20 percent. About 70 percent of the errors in certification involved overpayment. So I'm assuming that's federal overpayment to states. Uh, and 30 percent was underpayment. Uh, so I guess um, we seem to keep hearing these same things over and over again year after year, whether it's WIC, SNAP, uh, the student lunch program, uh, to the tune of billions and billions and billions of dollars. And quite often I hear from Ms. Fong when you appear before this committee that it's related to states improperly applying the categories uniformly across the country. And so I guess I'd want to know, um, are we just to accept this reality? And it's kind of along the question that Mr. Plaza was asking, you know, are we to accept these results or are there things that you would recommend to this committee that we would be able to do that would penalize states that are not applying the standards appropriately or penalize the USDA by reducing their, these programs by the amount of uh, these error rates? I think everyone understands there might be a small error rate, but when you're talking 20 percent uh, in some cases, uh, that's just unacceptable to any of our constituents. And we want to make sure that the dollars are spending go to the people who need it and deserve it. Uh, and if it's going to the wrong people and it's not getting to the right people and we're wasting taxpayer dollars and I don't think there's a Democrat or Republican constituent in this country that wants to see their hard-earned tax dollars wasted or improperly paid. So it's a concern I think we all share. What are we to do about it? Yeah, well, you, you raised some very good points on improper payments. And, and you also mentioned our SNAP report, which we just issued on quality control, where we point out specifically things that the states were doing that um, did not comply with federal policy and resulted in overpayments, a rise in improper payments. We have some very specific recommendations to FNS on how to fix that, uh, very specific in terms of the use of third-party contractors, in terms of their eligibility determinations, how they should quality control, and, and we have recommendations to FNS itself on what it should be doing to change the system. I think. You know, we issued, we made 19 recommendations. One thing that could be done would be to keep a very close eye on how the department responds to those recommendations. If it agrees to what we're saying, then we should be keeping a close eye on whether or not it gets implemented and whether that's effective. Can that be measured? And if the department does not agree, then we should be having a very broad and robust debate on the the reasons for the disagreement and how do we go from there. Well, I just think the recommendations are helpful, Ms. Fong, but uh, quite often we hear the same thing from the uh, officials when they come before the committee, that they're in the process of imp implementing them. Uh, we see the same error rates year after year. Um, you do a study every five or six years, we, you get sort of the same thing. And I guess uh, at some point, Either we're just going to come to accept that we just have 20 percent error rates in some of these programs and we waste money, or we're going to have to get serious about it. And I guess this committee uh, in particular may need to take states to task that are refusing to uh, follow the rules uh, and reduce the, the support, because I don't think we can continue to just send dollars and you make recommendations and p positions change, people change, members of Congress come in and out, but taxpayers still continue to foot the bill. So. One additional thing that I would add in terms of specific recommendations, as part of the compliance work on improper payments last year, it was the fourth year in a row that the department hadn't met requirements for improper payment. For several programs from FNS, child and adult care feeding program, school lunch, I think school breakfast, I think there was a WIC piece to it, they were required to put forth proposals so that they could get the, the error rates lower. As part of the current work that we're doing right now, we're looking at how they what proposals they put forward to, to, in order to, to make the changes. So we may have some additional recommendations as we close that report, which is expected in May. Well, one day I'd love to have this hearing with all of you and have you come back and say, we made these recommendations, they were implemented, and it went from 20 percent to 5 percent, and we save billions of dollars for taxpayers. Because otherwise, why are we even going through these exercises? And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for all being here today. I want to dovetail on something that Mr. Bishop, my colleague, was talking about and, and you had a conversation with regarding 
uh, recommendations for states to do a better job with certain programs. Do you follow up uh, and watch if the states are actually implementing these recommendations? Do you track that in any way? Uh, do you see progress there by them following you at all? Or, and just talk a little bit more about that. In, in terms of our general audit process, and this is just a very high level, when we issue an audit report, you know, we make recommendations, we have findings, and the department engages with us and ultimately either agrees with us or doesn't agree. If they agree with our recommendations, there's a whole process by which they are expected to take corrective action and then to report when they're done so that we have a record of the fact that they have reported that they have finished corrective actions. How often do they make corrective actions? What's the the well, Vegas odds here? Um, I don't under. have the specifics. We, we could certainly get that. But yeah. generally speaking, um, the department has a good record of agreeing with our recommendations. They generally agree ultimately with what we recommend. The corrective action piece of it may take them a little bit longer to implement depending on how long they're going. Where I think your question is going is do we or does somebody then come in and verify that the action has actually been taken and has it been effective in dealing with the underlying cause? And in some areas, when we plan our audit work, usually a few years after the initial audit, we will go back in and we'll look to see how those um, you know, corrective actions are going. Did they really work? For example, right now we have work in food safety, FSIS, where we are going out following up on some very significant recommendations we made about five or six years ago to make sure that everything is working the way we, we think it should be or the way the department thinks it should be. But it does, we can't do that um, sort of in, you know, on an annual basis. We do it as we plan follow-up work in the different program areas. You mentioned that it takes about six to 12 months to do an audit and investigation, depending on methodology, of course. About how many audits investigation do you do annually? Well, last year we issued 34, 38, 38 <laughs> kill those, 38 <laughs> audit reports. And Anne, do you have the figure for investigations? Um, so we track it a little bit differently. So we look at how many open investigations we have and on an average annually. That was my next question. How many then are not finalized and are still open? And how, how long is, <laughs> is your tickler list of that kind of thing? And how do you prioritize? Well, for investigations, we're a little bit different. Our time frame is a little bit um, longer than it, it is for audit. Our investigations can take anywhere from 18 months to two years to come to fruition because we're dealing with a number of judicial actions that have to take place. We go from a field work stage to prosecutorial stage to final sentencing um, in our investigative work. So our, our, it's a little bit, we don't have a finite, um, we're not able to say finite, um, we've closed X amount of cases. On average, we have probably about 1,000 investigations that are open annually. Um, so, and each day it, dif it differs. You may close an investigation one day and open an investigation. So it's hard for us to put a specific number the way that audit does. And they're all made public once you Our investigations are not made public. Okay. Um, where do your investigations come from? Is it internally you see something that needs to be analyzed? Is it from public pressure and, and uh, advocacy? Is it from Congress generally? How do you decide what to investigate? So with respect to how we get our investigative um, allegations, they come from a number of the locations you just identified. We get them from the public. We get them through our OIG hotline. We get them from referrals from the actual USDA agencies as well. Um, and so we have a number of steps that we look at to determine what we're going to pursue. It's a resource issue. It depends on the ability for us to pursue a criminal prosecution. A lot of our decision factor is can we get a case prosecuted? Um, you know, is there administrative remedies that we can take um, if we don't take the investigation, if we're not able to open it? Um, so we do get them from a number of different locations, and we have to assess each allegation that comes in to make that determination. Okay, and then just one final question. Uh, we saw the avian influenza, the bird flu, um, just destroy uh, livestock industry throughout the north, uh, the south, even in the west. I wonder if the OIG, if you folks conducted an audit of the USDA's response to avian influenza, the outbreak, um, including their surveillance coordinated response, that kind of thing. 
Um, and whether you, if you did, you worked with the state and local stakeholders as well. And if you didn't do one, would you consider doing so? Because this is going to happen again. It is, that is a topic that came up in our planning. And before we initiated, we, as we do with all of our work, we coordinate with GAO in terms of what their objectives and what they have in process. A number of the things that you, you've mentioned, they're already covering. And so what the position that we've taken right now is let's see what GAO does because their scope was fairly broad. There wasn't anything we could pick apart for, to do ourselves and see if there's anything else that we need to do down the road. Okay, I'd like to have further conversations with you all on that issue. Thank you very much. Let me just mention that we did do two audits of avian influenza and pandemic flu back in 2008 and 2006. So we do have a, a record of work in this area, and we are constantly monitoring it to see if there, it's an appropriate time for us to go back in. So we'll be happy to talk with you Great. more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to follow up a little bit more on the SNAP uh, issue. Uh, Back in September, the uh, OIG released a report that examined uh, FNS quality control uh, process for SNAP, uh, and the error rates found that uh, SNAP error rates had been understated. Uh, this uh, administration has been quick to point out that historically low SNAP errors um, rates, uh, even though the participation rates have uh, been uh, at record high levels. The OIG, however, found serious concerns with the quality control process and calls into question these low error rates. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is to briefly tell us what OIG's findings in the report and what was a particular concern with the FNS process. I'll just offer some broad comments and then Gil has all the specifics. We uh, initiated this audit partially in response to concerns raised by this subcommittee. Um, because I know that there has been questions as to whether the, the rate of improper payments and the rate of fraud um, were, were accurate. And so we started this work and we focused on the quality control system in SNAP. We had a number of findings, a, as we've been talking about. We noted that the use of third-party consultants by states was problematic um, and, and perhaps was not as envisioned by FNS itself. We noted that um, FNS's oversight of the quality control process was not as good as it should be. We, f we also found that the BBCE, the broad-based categorical eligibility provisions, raised questions because it appears that SNAP's um, practices and, and policies are not in accordance with SNAP regulations. And that raised an issue of concern to us, that there appears to be a different approach being taken in actuality than is envisioned in the regs for the program. And then we also raised a question about the conversion factors, the mathematical conversion factors um, for people whose, whose benefits are being calculated on a weekly, biweekly, or monthly basis. Uh, I believe that when we issued the report, FNS agreed with some of our recommendations. They did not agree with all of them. We are continuing to work with them on some of these issues. We're making progress, <laughs> and Gil, Gil has a much more up-to-date um, view on that. And I'll turn it over to you to add some. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of the progress, it, it, when we issued the report in September, we had agreement with 10 of the 19 recommendations. Just this past week, we got agreement on three more. So we continue to work with FNS and talk about what differences are or, or if there are differences or there's a way forward and whether we need to elevate the, the recommendations for decisions by higher people, either the undersecretary or the deputy secretary. That's just the basic process we use. Uh, but there was a lot of agreement with, with between us and FNS about how the process was working or not working. You know, Phyllis mentioned the, the, the third party consultants and error review, review committees. They were being used to help mitigate the errors as opposed to really point them out. And the two-tier structure of, of having the states do a sample and then FNS do a subsample, we raised questions with FNS as to whether there was, that was really a, an objective or, or it had some conflicts of interest in it because you've got states wanting to lower their error rates so they get the bonuses as opposed to having higher errors and maybe get penalties. So we've asked them and they've agreed to take a look at that. Um, taking a look at how the states were implementing the policies, it's like Phyllis said, there were, there were things that the states were just doing that wasn't in accordance with what FNS had expected them to do. 
Well, we also found that FNS wasn't providing the right oversight so that they wouldn't be aware, or if they were aware, that they took action to correct the, 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 the actions being taken by state people. Um, at the FNS level, we saw that they weren't doing the, the type of review that they said that they were going to be doing in terms of the thoroughness of the review and really following up and looking completely at the case file. You know, we found, you know, instances where, you know, they were just relying on what the, the states told them uh, or they, you know, got pieces of information or, but not all information. So those are some of the things that were really, you know, broken with the process that, that there has been agreement in terms of needs to be fixed and, and moving forward. Some of the more contentious ones w are, were the BBCE issue, um, but there again, it's like Phyllis describes, we're not trying to say one, is, one way is right or wrong. It does appear to be inconsistent with the underlying regs, and we feel like the, the general counsel's office at the department needs to opine on what is the right opinion on that. And uh, this may be an obvious answer to this, but uh, the method methodology used to formulate the report uh, and the OIG's understanding of uh, uh, FNS process has been questioned by some. But do you believe that the uh, OIG has accurately and properly uh, evaluated the FNS quality control process? I would say yes. I mean, we, we approached it how we do most, about how we do any other uh, review. We, we go out, we learn how the process works, we interview people, we look at documentation. When we were learning how things worked for this program at the national and at the regional level, at the state level, there were people from FNS's national office that were with us participating in those interviews. We looked at 100 and I think 40 case files. Um, we, we tried to make sure that we were looking at things as objectively as we could, so we, we made sure that we picked not just big states, but we had big states and small states um, to, to just to see how things would work, and we were in a number of FNS regions to see how it was done nationally. Let me just offer a comment on that. Um, at, we're, we're human, we're human beings, and there is a degree of judgment that we exercise under the audit standards. And so we're not saying that we're infallible. And certainly during the process of our audits, we learn a lot of things that we may not have known previously. And so we are open to discussion and um, reasonable dialogue back and forth. So I, I just want to say that because we, we certainly don't want to say that we're always 100% accurate every time. But I will also say that we are subject to peer review every three years by another OIG. It's required by law. And, and we have just received our peer review opinion. It's a clean opinion. Um, the HHS OIG came in and said that our work complies with professional standards. And so in that sense, we are following professional standards in terms of evidence and support and independence. All right, thank you. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just feel I want, I want to comment here. Um, I've been in Congress for 23 years, and it seems to me what we fail to do, particularly in this committee, because we're dealing with, with these big expenditure programs that really involve people. I mean, SNAP is adults program, and school lunches are, are the kids program. Big, big expensive programs. But I don't think, I think we, we dwell into uh, uh, to these issues on error rates, which I think is important to do, but we, we get so caught up in that that we forget to look at sort of best management practices. And we ought to be just, uh, we ought not be, be being, we, when we cut, squeeze, and trim on these programs, because we get angry with, 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 with what happened in errors, is that then the people that get cheated at the end are, are the kids, particularly in the school lunch program. And uh, this is really doesn't go to you. It just goes to the committee and, and what I hope we might, you know, f f concentrate in the future is how do we find best management practices? I've watched the way we give Social Security. We don't have people coming in and having to prove every year that they're, you know, qualified for Social Security. When we put people in the military, we don't, when they go to feed them, we don't have a difference between officers and enlisted personnel. When we have kids at school, we never have a means test to get on the bus or a means test to check out a library. Tape. But when you go into that cafeteria, we have seven different feeding programs. And you have got, the families first of all got to prove that they're poor. If you've ever seen that list, I mean, if, and, and if you don't speak English, it's gonna be very, it's gonna be impossible to fill it out. They've got all kinds of questions about your assets and things like that, capital investment. Those are, those are words that people don't even understand what they mean. And, and I think what we do is we put all the emphasis that if you're poor, you gotta prove it. 
and you got to prove it all the time. And when we really know where poverty exists, I mean, if school districts, and my, my, my school district complains that every year we have to go through this incredible bureaucracy of filling out all this paperwork, we've been a poor school for 40 years. We're the poorest part of town. It hasn't changed. And Vilsack was here yesterday saying America's poverty has not changed. It hasn't shifted around, it hasn't moved. It's the same places that it was uh, when we started the war on poverty. And so I would hope that our committee would think big about and, and really pressure um, our agencies to look and, and recommendations from you to come in with best management practices. I, I, I think we get in, it's so easy, particularly in school feeding programs, because I've been very involved in that, to find error rates because if you go in and talk to the people in the, in the, in the feeding program, they say, well, we have to assure every single day, we have to count that the kids who are getting the free and reduced meal are the poor kids. Not the hungry kids, the poor kids. Because if, if your family has more money, you may be hungry, your family may be dysfunctional, not preparing a lunch for you, not giving you money, never, you know, and, and yet you go to school really hungry. So what happens is the school kind of, the, the, they chip in and, and carry these kids. Um, and indeed, if they feed them, uh, that's an error. So, I mean, what's wrong with feeding hungry kids? And, and I would think that we ought to, we ought to think at, at half we're going to manage people. I think the SNAP system, I like the, you know, that's big, big stuff. But it, it baits on a debit card. Why don't we have a debit card for kids or, or uh, barcode this stuff so that they can report back? I, I, I hope our committee will start trying to clean up, um, in, in, in essence, uh, poverty programs that make it, very expensive to manage. Our Food for Peace program is the most expensive food in the world. Uh, we ought to be able to, you know, what the, those countries want is money to develop their own agricultural economy. Anyway, that's just my high horse, and because we were looking at stuff, I thought I'd say it. But let me uh, ask you here about, um, in December 2014, you issued a disturbing report on AFE's oversight of research facilities, uh, the compliance with the Animal Welfare Act. This was your fourth highly critical report of AFIS animal welfare work since 1992. Among the findings in the 2014 report, you said that it, since 2001, AVIS has conducted at least 500 inspections on 107 facilities that had not even had any animal activities for more than two years. AVIS did not follow through its own criteria when it closed at least 59 cases involving grave or repeated animal welfare violations. Penalties were on the average of 86 percent below the statutory maximum level. Some of the other findings, some of APHIS's veterinarians and institutional review boards were not adequately monitoring experimental procedures on animals. APHIS is our cop on the, on the beat for animal welfare. And we have 1,000 registered research facilities uh, with nearly 1 million animals used in research. So um, uh, if the budget for the animal welfare, which in my view is unconsciously tidy, and it's only $28 million out of a $871 million uh, budget for the agency, um, and with these minimal funds, their responsibilities are to oversee animal breeders, dealers, exhibitors, as well as research facilities. And so uh, my question to you is, what needs to be changed to allow APHIS to fully implement the animal welfare regulations? We, yeah, as you said, we have looked at this a number of times, and we've made recommendations to, for them to improve their, their practices. I think I would have to go back and think about from a budgetary angle. I know that when we talk to them, we know that they're operating within certain constraints, so we're trying to work with them to operate to the best they can with what they've got. Um, but every time that we go in and look at the animal welfare issues, there is something to, to report about. Uh, we're currently looking at um, animal welfare from the standpoint of marine mammals, um, specifically the orcas and the dolphins, but based on request. Um, and and we, we'll consider that question as, as we approach that as well. So the question, and maybe if we get back to it and see what you can pull up on how we need to change to allow APHIS to fully implement the Welfare Act. It may mean more money, but it may mean other things. And I'd appreciate your recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Fong, back to the issue of the implementation of the Farm Bill. 
are you familiar with the 2014 Farm Bill provision that requested that the USDA create a Undersecretary for Trade? And do you have any uh, understanding of where that is? I know we're spending money. I think we allocated a million dollars so that the Secretary could study this issue. And the Secretary said it's not an easy task. They want to, uh, you know, take some time to keep studying and spending money. And it's been a couple of years. I didn't know uh, if your agency had done any review of that and you had any sort of information that would help us understand the status of that. No, I, I think you're right. Um, I'm aware of the provision, and I think the Secretary probably gave you the most up-to-date status that's, that's available. Um, we're not aware of any additional information on that. Well, but we are keeping our eyes on the study that was requested so that we can look at that as soon as it's available. I mean, that is something that I flagged with our folks that liaison with the foreign acts. So we're essentially spending millions, million or more, to hire people to study the potential creation of the hiring of a position. It's, it's a wonderful system we have here. Um, another question related to the uh, that research facility in Nebraska. I know the chairman asked you some questions about that at the beginning of the hearing, and I, I, I know you have a review in process. You said it normally takes six months. This has been over a year now. What's the date specifically we would see a, a review on that or a report from your agency? We are in the final stages of field work on that. Okay. We issued an interim report, as you may be aware, last fall, which went through a number of the issues that we had been reviewing. Um, and I think our final report is due out in the next few months. It'll be spring of 2016. <clears throat> What's the status of the facility? I mean, in terms of as we have these hearings, we're going to have USDA officials before us. Um, what do we know from your interim report that would help us uh, properly examine that when they come before us? Well, the interim report, um, I think you might find it interesting. T my, my recollection of where we were is that some of the issues that were raised, we are still in the process of nailing down. Other issues that were raised in the New York Times article uh, perhaps are not as of much con as con much concern as the reporter may have had because they he documented things that are actually industry practice in a number of areas so i think it would be well worth um you know and we'd be happy to talk to your staff and go through the results of our interim report on areas that perhaps are not of concern and others that may be of concern thank you thank you mr chairman and i thank you mr chair uh, so I want to talk about conservation compliance for crop insurance. So the Farm Bill in 2014 um, included a provision that requires farmers who receive government subsidies for their crop insurance premiums are required to protect wetlands on their land and develop conservation plans when growing crops on land that's subject to erosion. So what I'm interested in is it seems to me there's a serious potential for noncompliance if there is no oversight of this provision. It seems like a very good provision to have. Um, so I'm interested to know what percentage of crop insurance premium subsidy recipients are legally bound by conservation compliance, and how is USDA or OIG monitoring or ensuring that farmers who are legally bound are in compliance? We currently have a, work, uh, a review in process uh, where we're looking at uh, the department's management of compliance with the highly erodible land wetland conservation provisions that was started in structure uh, looking at FSA and NRCS but it also includes the question because of what was in the 2014 farm bill how are they bringing RMA and that compliance aspect into how they approach determining compliance uh, we are close to issuing an interim report on this uh, which should be out, I think, in the next couple of weeks. Great. And then we will be following that with a, 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 a final report looking at the whole, uh, other aspects of the process. So we can get with you as soon as we're, we're ready to issue that. Good. Well, we're happy to hear your following on that. Um, I would only just add one thing. We probably don't all agree on this, but um, in your interim report on Mark, and I'll be interested to see, it, it seemed to me that there were times when describing something as an industry norm um, may be a way to explain why um, some people would consider it okay, but there seems to be some things that even if they are an industry norm, aren't necessarily a good practice and part of why we have 
um, research centers like this is to talk about good practices. And just because some things are happening in the industry doesn't mean that's what the future of farming should look like, doesn't mean what consumers want, doesn't mean what's humane to animals, doesn't mean it's, uh, you know, cost effective. There's, there are a lot of reasons why an industry norm may not be an excuse for something that isn't right. So I uh, will look forward to seeing what your final report says, but I, I don't, I didn't find that completely um, a reasonable argument. And I hope you'll think about about that a little bit in the final report. <laughs> You're saying okay. I, I, I appreciate your, your insight and I understand. <laughs> Thank you for uh, allowing me to follow up on a, an issue. I, I was kind of struck by our last conversation. I asked pretty pointedly, and it was an assumption that this was just a yes answer. I asked all, all your audits and investigations made public. Uh, yes to the audits, but you said no on the investigations, and I'm having a little bit of a problem digesting that in, in um, you know, in the, the rubric of transparency and accountability. How would we know then if something's going wrong, if there's fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement, criminal activity maybe? How would we know about it for the taxpayer? How would we correct that if we're not able to, to see these? And what is the, the rationale for not sharing these investigations. If it's a matter of privacy, uh, certainly that can be redacted, I would, I would believe. But what is the, the rationale here? Um, just in the course of the investigations, there are times when we are utilizing information we obtain through grand jury and other judicial processes which we cannot release publicly. Um, so as a result, we, you know, the reports are available. You can FOIA them. And if the report of investigation is closed and it would be potentially released, um, redacted, um, we do also highlight um, our good casework in the SARC, the semi-annual report to Congress. And additionally, we do, there are certain investigations which we are required to make public, such as our wildland fire fatality investigations. Um, we are required to, to post the findings from those investigative results publicly. Um, and we do turn the information over to, you know, if there's something that we identify that's a systemic issue, we'll share that information with our counterparts in audit if it's something that they need to be looking at and perhaps they want to pursue um, from an audit perspective. Um, additionally, we would share our information. Our reports of investigation do go to the department officials. Um, so if there's something that was to be addressed, the department officials are receiving that information as well. Is this a standard practice amongst all the departments and agencies regarding um, their IG office approach on this? Um, yes, my understanding, I mean, from a law, for the law enforcement um, entities within the IG community as well as the federal law enforcement community in general, that is a standard practice. Okay, so they're not made public in, in terms of releasing them, but people can find out what these investigations are, and you can share those more, maybe more detailed with members of Congress so we can ensure some yes. accountability. Okay, yes, thank I'm you. Yes, I didn't mean to imply otherwise. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you very much. Um, and let me just, uh, I'm just going to discuss one area here. Uh, it's my understanding that some employees of the executive branch and the legislative branch, for that matter, uh, that they may not engage in political activity while on official business. We kind of all understand that, uh, including work hours using official resources because of the Hatch Act and other ethical restrictions. But recently there have been anecdotal rumors that employees of the department uh, have been engaging some activities during the work hours. And my qu question is, uh, what's your role? What's the IG's role in identifying and investigating that kind of activity? Is that a role of the IG or is it Office of Ethics? Who would be investigating that when that occurs? Um, so that would depend on the nature of the allegations. Um, normally, we work very closely with our Office of Ethics within our department. Um, we have a very good relationship, so we would assess what the allegations were specifically. Um, and obviously, if it's something that's potentially criminal in nature, um, we would absolutely open an investigation, or even if it's if it really is a conflict of interest or some other prohibited activity, um, our office would pursue an investigation on that. And uh, other than the Hatch Act, I mean, there are, other res are there any other kind of restrictions that deal with it, or is that statutorily? Well, the Office of Special Counsel actually has the responsibility for looking at prohibited political activity. Um, so if there are allegations, we also do coordinate our activities with the Office of Special Counsel to um, to ensure that we're, you know, we're working in coordination on those matters. 
So if one of the employees in the department or a regular citizen suspected that there was a, or that, that another employee was violating these restrictions, who would they go to? Would they contact OIG, the Office of Ethics? I mean, is it clear and who would, who would it be? It would usually be our office. Um, we have, you know, the employees have the opportunity to find us uh, on site or the general public can reach us through the OIG hotline. Um, where they can file a complaint or an allegation or concern that they have, and those complaints are assessed by our investigation staff to determine what the best way to address them and handle them. Okay, and I take it they're confidential. Those That's correct. Course, you yeah. have the um, when you file a complaint, you have the opportunity. We receive them anonymously at times. Um, they can remain confidential, or the individual can choose to allow us to disclose their name and information. So it's up to the individual filing the complaint. Now, do the rules differ depending on whether or not what, the different type of employees, whether you're SES, political employees, GS civil service, are the rules different? No, I mean, they don't, the rules are the same with respect to uh, confidentiality, is that? No, the, with the rules with respect to engaging in political activity. Yes, the rules are, I'm sorry, the rules are very different dependent on what category of employee you are within the federal government. Um, SES employees are, uh, have a different level. Political employees are allowed to do some political activities during government hours. So yes, there is a, a differentiation between um, what type of activity you can engage in depending on what category of employee you are. And with what, what um, where would you find how these different categories, what the limitations are on these different categories? Um, usually the department actually does provide training uh, relative to uh, ethics as it pertains to political activities, especially during election years. Um, additionally, you can go to the Office of Ethics website for the department. Um, or contact them specifically if you have specific specific questions to, that need to be addressed. But your office doesn't have a summary of that that you can make available to me, do you? Um, I don't believe we do. So I'd have to ask the Office of Ethics, you believe? Yes, that's that. correct. Um, let's, let's, we can do what we can to coordinate within the department okay. to see if there's a that, very quick summary of Thank you very much. If you get that to me, I'd appreciate that. I yield back. Last question. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's come to my attention that um, there's been some complaints raised uh, about USDA's discriminating against women farmers and Hispanic uh, farmers on um, sort of the the, the two-tiered system uh, that results in fewer monetary awards uh, to this group than to other farmers. Uh, an example was given of women and Hispanic farmers who tried to apply for loans but could not do so because discrimination, discriminatory reasons were required to provide sworn witness statements and original documentations from decades ago, but other farmers in the same category were not. Uh, the USDA's Minority Farm Advisory Committees recognized these disparities, but uh, have USDA hasn't done anything to alleviate the differences. Has your office looked into these complaints at all? We have an ongoing review right now of the um, department's settlement agreement with the Hispanic farmers and with women farmers. It's the Garcia and Love litigation, where the department reached a settlement agreement in light of prior practices and agreed to pay appropriate claims and I think the department's very much um, in the middle of that. We are looking at it. We expect to have a review, a report, in the next couple of months. So we, we can certainly brief your staff on, on the results of that. Yeah. Okay. okay, Mr. Laurel. Thank you very much, and my apologies to you. Just with regard to the uh, women farmers and the Latino farmers, with all due respect, uh, <clears throat> Madam Inspector General, I will just tell you that the settlement is nowhere near uh, what happened uh, with, uh, with uh, African American farmers and with Native American farmers. They deserved everything that they received, and the women farmers and the uh, Latino farmers deserve the very same treatment. Uh, so they have been discriminated against in this process. Uh, let me move to, uh, I'm going to just put some things out in the record. I know it's late, and I know I'm the last one here, and I don't want to hold folks up. In your testimony, you mentioned the integrity of the federal safety net programs, specifically calling out SNAP. Uh, it's my understanding there are serious disagreements on the part of the FNS with the report you, uh, you all did on SNAP. I'll raise those issues at the FNS hearing. I think it's important for us to understand 
the issue of SNAP errors and fraud in the broader context of other programs under USDA's jurisdiction. I understand that OIG has completed several significant fraud investigations in USDA's farm programs. Let us begin to hear about that. And can you tell me how many convictions connected with defrauding the Federal Crop Insurance Program have occurred over the last decade? Annually, how much does FCIP fraud cost taxpayers? What is the FCIP fraud rate for 2015? And how does it compare to previous years? How does it compare to the SNAP program fraud rate? And what recommendations have the Office of the Inspector General made to address crop insurance fraud? Uh, a lot of questions. I, I can I get them to you, but I, quite frankly, am tired of all of the fraud, waste, and abuse discussions about SNAP, which has the lowest error rate of any federal program, and nowhere, no how, do we get any information about program integrity from any of these other programs. It's wrong. It's unfair. I am going to request an investigation so that we get the data and information we need and to do business on this committee and, and, and talk about the inequity that is foisted on the SNAP program. Uh, the female farmers we've talked about, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, public health uh, information system, I will lay out the question. What progress has FSIS made in implementing the recommendations with your office? Will you revisit the audit report in the future to assess FIS's pr progress and when? Do you intend on evaluating the implementation of PHIS for import ex uh, uh, inspection, and if so, when? But again, I will get that to you so as not to hold up the chairman. Rancho Beef, what specific actions have USDA taken against any inspection personnel at that plant? What changes in inspection procedures have been instituted to prevent such instances uh, from occurring in the future? So I don't know if there's anything you can answer right now in this, in this period as the clock is running. Uh, and if not, I will present those. And I would like, uh, I really would like answers. And I'm going to talk with uh, staff about instituting an investigation into some of these other programs where I believe there's rampant fraud and abuse, but nobody seems to want to take a look at it. Thank you very much for being here. As you've heard, those are the buzzers that have Right. have wrong and the uh, speaker has cracked down on our yes, time to get has. to the floor yeah, now yeah. so uh, I think we probably better adjourn but uh, thank you uh, Ms. Fong for being here also uh, Ms. Uh, Coffey and Mr. Uh, Harden thank you for being here and your work as well and uh, we look forward to following up with you on some of the issues that's been brought forward in our hearing this morning thank you Meeting is, uh, the uh, subcommittee is adjourned